so now we had enough fun with Lambda Phi 4 and we want to move on to a more phenomenologically relevant theory, right? Which is Q, QED. Uh, now, as opposed to, to, to Lambda Phi 4, QED is hugely determined by its uh, symmetries, right? Especially the U1 symmetry, right? The global and local, right? So the gauge symmetry of QED. And, and by uh, also some symmetries related to the fermions in QED. So before we move on to the next step, which is do the, doing the power counting in QED to see uh, the structure of divergences in QED, and at the same time looking at what uh, uh, physical quantities we'll be looking for in experiments and doing the redefinitions, which will also eliminate those divergences. We want to explore the symmetries a little bit because that will constrain QED a lot, right? And we will also influence the power counting. So we have to, to do that first. In order to do that, we'll look at the Ward Takahashi identities. And the first thing we want to do is to get our terminology straight because there are three very closely related concepts we'll be dealing with here. And we want to, uh, we don't want to uh, make it look like they are the same thing, right? Which are uh, gauge invariants, current conservation, and the word identities or the word Takahashi identities. So let's start with gauge invariance, right? So how can I define gauge invariance? So the idea here is that I have some Lagrangian for my theory, in this case, QED as understood by a photon and an electron, right, only. And so the Lagrangian will be in, in Minkowski space, this one. So I have the kinetic term for the photons. I have the fermionic uh, kinetic term and, and also the covariant derivative appears here. So you have also the interaction with uh, the photon. Let me put this in another color because these are the bare uh, before renormalization, right? These are the coupling constant, the charge before any renormalization. And also a mass term, also before any renormalization of the fermionic field, right? So this is, this is what I'm calling QED for, for, for the length of uh, the next few videos, right? I put these uh, zeros here in, in purple because I don't want to overload the, the video with uh, notation. So I'll, I'll suppress this zero for now because I, I won't be doing renormalization in this, in this one. So I'll come back with the zero when I need it. But keep in mind, these are really the the parameters in the Lagrangian before any redefinition. They are not uh, related, right? Or not uh, forcibly related to the experimental values of, uh, of anything, right? So this, uh, this uh, Lagrangian has a symmetry under transformations of the fields, right? So if I do a transformation here, which takes the photon field, electromagnetic uh, field into this where alpha x is any function of uh, position right and psi transforms in this way of course here i have in mind the infinitesimal transformation right so alpha is small that's why I'm writing it in this way, right? Then this uh, Lagrangian goes into the same Lagrangian, right? So this Lagrangian is invariant under this particular transformation. And that's what I'm calling gauge invariant. So it, gauge invariance. So this is a property of the Lagrangian under a transformation of the field, right? So that's the first uh, concept. The second one is current conservation, right? So we know that this uh, local transformation also contains a global transformation. It's the particular case where 
alpha x is just alpha, just a constant independent of position, right? And that implies by Nether's theorem, right, that there is a conserved current. So this uh, invariance of the Lagrangian implies an invariance of the action. And then by Nether's theorem, you, you have a conserved current associated with that transformation. And in this case, the current is just uh, psi bar of x, gamma mu psi of x, right? So, uh, you see, they are related concepts, right? So, gauge invariance, specifically the global part of that symmetry implies current conservation, but they are not the same thing, right? In fact, if we were able to construct a, a, a theory for the same physical systems that did not depend on, on, on Lagrangians and, and, and these uh, field operators, we would still have current conservation because that's experimentally verified, right? So this is more closely related to what we we see uh, in nature, right? To, to physical things than the fields themselves, right? In, fa in fact, the the, the local uh, symmetry is mostly related to a redundance in our definition of the fields, right? Uh, so they're not the same, right? Now we also have shown that that we we have. Um, seen in the quantum field theory one course, specifically video 27. I'll put the links to, to the video and the, the pages in the lecture notes of quantum field theory one. We have shown that this can be translated to the quantum version of the theory. Of course, both these results are classical, right? So I have a classical field theory here which has this uh, uh, classical equation of motion, right? You can see this as an equation of motion for the current or, or if you substitute the fields, you can take uh, equations for, for the fields from here, right? This is all classical. But we have seen that as long as the theory is not anomalous, so what does that mean, right? If you never heard it before, it means that the same symmetries that are valid at classical level are still go good at the quantum level. Right? So assuming our, our theory is not anomalous, we have shown in quantum field theory one that this uh, current conservation becomes something like um, this. So we have now a constraint on the expectation values of this uh, derivative of the current, right? We can, which can easily be turned into constraints on the green functions of your theory, right? If you choose, uh, put the operators there and choose the states, right, around it. The simplest uh, case we can show of this is the word identity proper, right? As, as the one. Uh, derived by by Ward, right? And to to see that, uh, let's let's think of a complicated, pretty general diagram, right? With uh, any number of photons and, and electrons here, but I'm choosing one of the photons, right? This this guy here with momentum k, right? And writing the amplitude in terms of this guy. What what you can easily see, right? Is this this is generically I can call it like that, right? This is just some amplitude in your theory that depends on k and many other parameters. I'm, I'm not uh, writing all the momentum dependencies here. I mean, there are many states, right? But I can, without any laws of gener uh, generality, right, define something like that, right? I can write this guy in terms of some other uh, sub-diagram, right? A sub-amplitude that I write there. Uh, let me call that m mu of k, right? Times the polarization of this electron, uh, this photon, right? If I think this photon is on shell, right? The way this will enter the this this amplitude is through its polarization, which needs to be contracted with 
this mu index somewhere inside that more complicated diagram that I have down there, right? So the generic form of this object will be this, right? And now I'm interested in the properties of this guy in blue right here, right? And in order to, uh, to, to uh, figure out the properties of this guy, all I have to remember is that this index needs to be contracted to the QED uh, vertex where the photon is originating inside here, right? It's a complicated diagram, but one thing I'm sure, the photon is going all the way into some vertex in there. And that vertex looks like the current, right? In fact, on that vertex, I have the action of the fermionic fields that, right, that uh, contract with that photon, right? That's where that uh, new index is located in there, in a vertex that is given by this. Right? And so I can write, right? I can write M mu, this guy, of K, in momentum space, right? As the Fourier transform, because I know uh, the momenta, the momentum going into that vertex, right? And X is just the position I'm choosing for that vertex, right? Of the expectation value of J mu X I, right? And here, these states are quite arbitrary, right? I just have to decide these external states, which ones are I'll, I'll throw into the past, which ones I'll throw into the future, but I know that J mu will be in between those two groups of states. So these uh, initial and final states are subsets of these external legs, and I don't care too much uh, how many are in one direction or, or the other, right? This is pretty uh, generic so far. Now I can use these uh, generalize word identity here to write the following, right? I can take the Fourier transform of that identity, right? So d for x exponential of i k x of the expectation value of del mu j mu, right? This needs to be zero, right? As per this identity, right? But then I can do an integration by parts here. All I have to assume is that the fields die at infinity, right? They go, they go to zero at infinity, so I don't need that surface term. And then I can rewrite these in this way. I throw the derivative on this exponential, right? Exponential of i k x expectation value of j mu. Hmm. And of course, this derivative acting here, right, just brings down uh, a power of uh, k, right? I don't care about the i because this needs to be equal to zero. So what I'm concluding is that k mu times this Fourier transform j mu is equal to zero. Right? And this is exactly what I have up here. Right? So what I'm showing is that k mu m mu of k is equal to zero, which is the original word identity. Right? A very useful, very useful identity it will constrain a lot of uh, what we'll do in QED next, right? And tells us that if you take any external photon on, on a complicated uh, uh, QED amplitude and exchange that polarization vector of, of the photon by the momentum of that photon, that, need, that product needs to be zero. And that constrains, of course, the form of these guys, right? These guys need to be in a particular form that satisfies this equation. And that is, you can impose that on all the amplitudes of your theory. So it's a huge constraint. 
as you might notice. Right? But this, this derivation is uh, nice, but you see here I used the polarization vector of a photon instead of the propagator. So I'm kind of assuming this, this photon is on shell, even if I didn't take k square equal to zero anywhere. Right? I could do that with the uh, with the, the propagator tube, but I didn't. Right? And also this comes straight from the global symmetry, right? I didn't use the local symmetry. We want to do something more general, which is the war Takahashi identity. But I want also to keep this uh, flow of uh, the logic here clear, right? Before we go forward, which is the invariance in the Lagrangian implies current conservation, right? If you are doing a field theory in terms of Lagrangians, right? And current conservation, if preserved in the quantum theory, right? So if you have no anomalies, and this is a point we didn't touch in, in quantum field theory one. Also, we know that if you calculate these things at one loop level, there might be infinities. You might need to regularize those infinities. And this, this connection between these two equations Right, this thing here is also only valid if your uh, regularization is not destroying your your symmetry. Right, so there's actually this extra condition, which is the theory needs to not be anomalous, and you need to have a regularization that preserves the symmetry. That second one is not so important in 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 the sense that we'll choose regularizations that do that. Anomalies are beyond our control, right? Some theories are anomalous, right? And we'll see if, if we, we get to anomalies by the end of the course. But bearing these complications, uh, you have now a, a quantum version of current conservation. And that is what word identity or word identities in general are. Right? They are a, a quantum version of current conservation that can always be expressed as constraints or relations between amplitudes or green functions. Right? So, and, and that's pretty general. Right? That's a similar story for Schwinger-Dyson equations, which are the quantum version of uh, uh, the equations of motion for the field also translate into relations between green functions, and that will be the same for the Ward Takahashi identities we want to show today. So, how do you get those? Right? What we want to do now is to use the full uh, gauge invariance of the theory, right? And derive uh, something similar to the Ward identities. So let me write the Lagrangian again. Right? So this is what we were we are talking about. plus i, psi bar, and mu, del mu, plus i, e, a mu, psi, minus m, psi bar, psi. And you might remember, again, remember, I'm not putting the zero here, but these are all, this is the uh, non-renormalized uh, theory, right? And you might remember that when we were quantizing this, uh, this theory. Again, this is something we did in quantum field theory one, and I'll put the link to the video in the description. Right? Uh, we had to, to do uh, some uh, procedure to, to deal with the gauge symmetry when we were quantizing this theory. Right? And we got a, a Lagrangian, which we called the effective Lagrangian which had an extra term here, which is the gauge fixing term right, of this theory. We'll call this the Lagrangian uh, gauge fixing term. And also to get the partition function, which is the generating functional for all the green functions in my theory, I had to introduce uh, these sources, right? This is the source for the 
electromagnetic field, and these are the sources for the fermionic fields. Right? So in, in essence, I used an action that was given by this effective Lagrangian up here, plus the terms for the sources, which I can write like this, right? And of course, by looking at these forms, especially these terms in, in, in red, let me put these guys in red too, right? You might get the impression that my, my theory is not gauge invariant anymore because I have a gauge fixing term here, which is not gauge invariant, nor are these, these uh, source terms, right? But that's, that's, um, that's, that cannot be true for two reasons, right? First, the procedure, the fadev popov uh, procedure that I used to get this gauge fixing term was nothing but putting identities inside my path integral, right? So I didn't really change anything. I just rewrote the path integral in a way to separate the gauge redundancy from uh, this uh, path integral that sums over the physically unequivalent field configurations, right? So I didn't change my theory. So if the, the theory I started was gauge invariant, this needs to be true for the resulting theory too, right? And, and also the sources, right? These are just uh, fictitious uh, sources that I'm putting in to write a generating functional. Right? And in the end, my theory should not depend on these guys, nor should I break gauge invariance with uh, uh, sources that in the end I'm taking to zero anyway. Right? And that means that despite these changes, right, uh, my theory needs to satisfy the condition that the variation of uh, the variation of the partition function needs to be zero because this is where all the physical information is encapsulated. That's where all the green functions come from. And of course, the variation here refers when I do the field transformation, right? The gauge uh, is invariant under the gauge transformation. It's important to not be confused by this because that's the condition I'm using to derive the war Takahashi identities. But I'm not really imposing this. This is more uh, like a consistency test of, of my procedure, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I don't have to impose this. In fact, you could, in principle, calculate a number of green functions and, the, and, and this would come out naturally without having to be imposed on your theory. In fact, if you look, uh, for instance, Peskin and Schroeder's book, they derive the war Takahashi identities without even referring to, to the Lagrangian, right? The reason I like this approach is that we get to a more general version of the war Takahashi identities, which then can be particularized to the version that uh, uh, Peskin gets, for instance. Right? So don't be confused by this. This, this is, is not something I'm imposing. It's, 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 the only, it's just a consistency demand, right? It's a test that I didn't do anything wrong before. But what that, does that imply, right? If my theory is well behaved and I did nothing wrong, this needs to be true. And now this imposes a constraint on how this, these changes will appear because this part of the Lagrangian does not transform at all, so I don't have to, to worry about it. It's already invariant and gauge transformations. But now I, I need to look at how these parts in red transform and see what kind of constraint I get if I, uh, if I, I know this is true, right? So let's see how the first, how the gauge fixing term transforms. So this part right here, del mu a mu square will go to, I just have to use the version of the gauge transformations I wrote at the start, 
and see that this goes into so the first field goes into del mu a mu plus this right this is just the second derivative because i have an extra derivative here right this is del mu del mu alpha right this box here and uh, since i have this square i also have a second part which is given by this right? remember i'm writing the infinitesimal version of these transformations so i can ignore terms uh, of order alpha square so i'll rewrite these as this this first term right and it that's equal to the original one so the variation is the next term which is the cross term here right these multiply by these and, and vice versa you have two options so that conceals this factor two del mu a mu times this right plus order of square terms which i'll uh, ignore now this term right here right this is all inside a, a, a d4 x integral in the action right so i can do an integration by parts here again i'm demanding that uh, fields uh, go to zero at infinity right and throw these uh, two derivatives that i have here into the the vector potential right so i can rewrite these guys since i do that twice there's no sign right i can rewrite these as the d4x integral of of course times this factor in front del mu a mu of alpha x now all derivatives are acting on a now I have to do the same. This is so. This is this uh, blue part here times minus one over psi is, is the variation of the gauge fixing part, and now I want to know the variation of the source terms. So let me write them. This is j mu a mu plus eta bar psi plus psi bar eta. It's important to remember in this part of the calculation that these are all Grassmann, right? I'm thinking in terms of path integral formulation so these are all Grassmann variables I have to be careful with uh, with the order of these fermionic fields and the fermionic sources right and I can call these the uh, uh, source terms right I call it LF because source in Portuguese is uh, starts with letter F right so this goes again into the same lf right plus the variation introduced by changing this field the fields this is easier so this is just the mu alpha minus i e alpha eta bar psi which is the transformation of this guy plus i e alpha psi bar eta which is how this guy transforms right again i want to do integration by parts here essentially i'm trying to isolate this alpha because it's arbitrary right this needs to be true for any alpha right? so i want to take the derivatives out of the alphas right in order to be able to do something that is true for any alpha so integration by parts here gives me a term that is Right. del mu j mu alpha x so i threw the derivative on the source and again i'm assuming that the sources also go to zero at infinity right i'm really not worrying about surface terms right they can exist in very specific situations and then this gets more complicated but for now we don't have to worry about that and then I can look, right? This is the variation introduced by the gauge fixing terms. 
this is the variation, right? This blue piece plus this one, these two here, right? But everything just repeats, right? So I have the same gauge fixing term here, the same source term here, right? And that means that my Z, my uh, uh, my gen my my uh, generating functional, right? My partition function, right? which is defined by this path integral, some normalization of the path integral over all these three fields. Of the exponential of, or exponential of uh, the action, right? Will go to, under the gauge transformation, these will become just, let me copy this. Right, the same action plus the exponential of i. Let me write it like this just to get more space. The exponential of i times the variation of s that comes from the blue terms I wrote above. So this will be the integral in the 4x. And now I just have to copy all those terms here. This is coming from the gauge fixing part. Right, these three derivatives acting on a mu. Now the part from the source, this one, minus del mu j mu. Now the part from the fermionic fields, sources actually, uh, minus i e here, uh, eta bar psi plus i e, right, right here, i e psi bar eta, right, and of course this is all multiplying alpha of x, which I conveniently uh, factored out, right. So this is uh, the variation, the variation of z is given only by this part. In fact, I could, again, since alpha is, is small, right, I could expand this exponential and rewrite this is, so z goes into z plus, which is the, the, the first term in the exponential here is just one, right, so get z again, plus the variation, that is all of these, right? So let me copy the path integrals and then this whole thing times the original exponential of the action, right? And this is uh, the variation of z, right? This whole thing uh, here. All of this. Now I can think of this uh, uh, piece in, uh, in brackets here as an operator acting on this exponential, specifically in the source terms in this exponential. All I have to do is exchange the fields by derivatives on the sources, right? We used this trick many times before since in the source, the only way the sources appear here is in linear terms, like multiplications of the source by the field, it's very easy to exchange the fields in this term by derivatives. I just have to be careful in the case of the fermions, right? Because of, of uh, they, they are anti-commuting variables. So Psi is easy. Psi I just exchange by one over I. I have to compensate for this I up here, right? Derivative in eta bar, right? But psi bar, I have to exchange by minus one over i del, del eta, because psi bar is to the right of the eta, right? Uh, actually, eta is to the right of the psi bar in the source term, so the derivative must go through these and there's an extra sign. For mu, I don't have this complication, so I just exchange that again for one over i the derivative in j mu right and once i do that 
all right? These uh, fields now, they are just derivatives. They do not depend on the fields themselves. So I can take this whole piece, right? Outside the path integral, right? So I'm defining now this operator. Let me write it here this operator, which is now uh, written in terms of the derivatives in, in the sources. And is defined by I over Psi A mu. Oh, sorry. That's what I'm doing, right? I'm exchanging the field or the derivative. I absorb a sign by bringing i to the numerator. This is the only one that does not change because it didn't involve the field, just the source. And then this whole part, I already had some i's here. I have to do it consistently. I hope the signs are right. But this is what I get, right? This is what this becomes once I exchange all the fields by the derivatives. And now this whole piece comes out of the path integral. And what's left is just n the path integral of the action, right? The exponential of the action, which is again z. So what I'm writing here is that z goes to z to 1 plus i the integral of this operator, right? Alpha actually can go through the operator too, right? acting on z. So the operator really acts on z. And now the condition, right? remember the condition I wanted at the start was this, right? becomes of course just that the operator acting on z should be zero across the zero here. So I thought confused with the operator side. So this is zero. So the equation that needs to be satisfied is just this one, right? Again, this is a consistency demand I'm making from my theory, but it actually allows me to glimpse a lot on the form that the green functions that come out of this, it must have to be consistent with gauge invariance. Right? Now I want to exchange Z for W, which is the uh, generating functional of the connected functions, right? This is something, again, I define in quantum field theory one. I'll put the link to the video in the description, right? You might remember this. Just keep in mind over in quantum field theory one, we were doing everything in Euclidean space. So that I is not there, right? It's just exponential of W or minus W, I don't remember. Hmm? Now, if I substitute this here, I get an equation for W, right? So I could just have to put the exponential there and apply uh, these derivatives to W, right? Because W has sources in there too. That one becomes, again, there's an extra I that goes down with the W. So this is eliminated in, in favor of minus one over Psi. Same thing again. But now W is here, minus this part, which just repeats. And this part will be an extra I, so minus I coming from here. And everything here, I repeat, but there's a, a W now in here. So this is del W. And so is this.
And of course, I get the exponential again, again in all of these derivatives. So I still have these out here, right? And of course, this translates into the condition that the thing under brackets here needs to be zero, right? So this thing needs to be zero. I just invert this one, which gives me a plus sign because these are all anti-commuting objects. Mm -hmm. And of course, since this is the generator of uh, connected functions, right? This condition will translate into, uh, into relations between connected uh, functions. But we can make this even better, right? Because we're really interested here in the 1PI uh, functions, not the connected one. But we also saw, right, in quantum field theory one, again, I'll put a link to all of these quantum uh, field theory one uh, uh, prerequisites to this thing in the, in the in the description, we saw that we can get from the generator of the connected functions to the generating functional of the 1PI functions by doing a Legendre transform, right? Which in this case, I'll define like this. There's some freedom in, with the signs here. So be careful when comparing books, right? Here I'm following quite closely uh, Ryder's book, and he defined this Legendre transform with a minus sign in this case, J mu minus D4x eta bar psi classical. So this strange symbol here is CL in my bad uh, written, uh, but uh, this is the object connected to the sources in the, in the Legendre transform, right? And they go to zero as the sources go to zero too. So the same way the, the generating function of four, the connected functions is given in terms of the sources, this generating functional for the 1PI functions is given in terms of these classical fields, right? Which really can be interpreted as classical fields in a sense, in the presence of sources, right? But here they are just all going to zero at the end, right? And from this uh, transform, you get co uh, relations between the sources and the classical fields, which are these. Again, you have to be careful with the Grassmann character of the fermionic fields and the, the fermionic sources, but these are the relations you get, right? You just have to, to take derivatives in this, this in, and you get these relations. So this is minus J mu, and conversely, the derivative of W in relation to J mu is a mu classical. Same thing goes for the fermionic fields with a few sign changes here and there, which you can check, which is plus eta, eta bar, del w, del eta bar, psi classical, del gamma, del psi bar classical, minus eta, del w, del eta, minus psi bar classical, right? And then I can use all of these uh, relations, right? At least these three on the right, to substitute everything here and, and disappear with w, right? I don't want w, I want uh, gamma there, right? And that's the relation I get, right? I cannot show the two at the same time, so I just, yeah, I won't have space here, 
So let me just write answers, just simple substitution anyway. Right? This is minus one psi, all the derivatives, plus down mu. And here I, I can exchange the source, right? I also want to get rid of the sources because I want to write everything in terms of these variables on the left here. So I have to replace j mu by del gamma del a mu classical. When the sign is right, minus i e del gamma del psi classical psi classical plus psi bar classical del gamma del psi bar equal to zero right so let me put a box around here this because this is the generalized word uh, Takahashi relation. I right? have a very general version of it. Now, this is pretty neat, right? Because I know that if I want to obtain any uh, one PI function in my theory, all I have to do is to apply a certain number of these uh, functional derivatives on this gamma, right? Suppose I was interested in the 1pi functions with four external functions, right? All I have to do is to look at this uh, guy, right? With four fields here, right? The classical fields. Yeah? And I can apply that to both sides of this equation, right? And make this object appear here. Of course, I'll get other objects too. And that's where the relations between these different 1pi functions will come from. Right? Just to give an example, suppose we were interested in a relation where this guy here appears, right? The, a 1pi function, a 3-point 1pi function in QED that involves two fermions and a photon, right? So what I'm interested in is the object that comes from this combination of derivatives. Psi bar and psi, everything is the classical version. Right? I'm interested in this object. Hmm? Since I already have here one derivative in the photon, right? I'm sure that if I apply these other two derivatives here, right? The one in the psi bar classical and the one in psi classical then this object will appear here. And I want to see what else appears, right? So let's do that. Let's, let's take a look at what happens if I take this these equation and apply del psi. Let, let's give name to this guy. So I have to decide on the position of all these derivatives, right? When I do these uh, functional derivatives, I introduce a dependency on some position here. So I assume the one here is x, right? And I'll call the one for the psi classical y1 and the one for the psi bar classical x1. And the one already there will be x, which is also is the only position here. So these derivatives here are also derivatives uh, with respect to x position, right? So now, the first thing, these, these derivatives won't do anything here. This will be just zero because this term does not depend on psi or psi bar classical, right? On this piece, they will generate what I want, right? So I have three uh, derivatives acting on gamma, and that's exactly the object I'm interested in. So I have to see what they do here, right? I want, I want to see what happens when I apply these derivatives here, right? So just to give an example, right? let's do these uh, schematically. Let's look at the first term, and then the second term is very similar, 
right? I'm interested in doing the upside. Let me copy this just not to write everything again. Let me put this to the side. And what I'm trying to look at is what happens when I do this. Del gamma, del psi classical, psi classical, right? And now I'm acting with these guys uh, here, right? So uh, let me act with this guy first, right? It goes over here. That's a minus sign since I'm talking about Grassmann variables. Right, and I'm also bringing this psi classical to this side. That's another minus sign, and that gives me right. Once this derivative gets to this guy, which is calculated at x. Remember, I'm I'm choosing the only position appearing here to be x, right? So the derivative of psi classical x in relation to psi classical at y one, right? will give me a Dirac delta of x minus y1 times this guy, right, which I brought to the right. And of course, on the outside of this equation, I still have this guy right here. So this is what I got here. Right, and then I move this guy inside. Of course, it will act on gamma, but I uh, uh, and that will give me a two-point one pi function here, right? Which I defined before. If you look for fermions, right? This is defined as So this is calculated position x, and this is calculated at position x1, right? And this is, uh, with pi, psi bar on the right here, is how we define the two-point function for fermions, because that will give us a, a, um, the inverse of a full propagator, right? So that's how we want to write with the psi bar to the right. Similarly, right, doing the same derivatives here will get me a Dirac delta, but now instead of a Dirac delta of x minus y1, it will be a Dirac delta of x minus x1, because now the first guy to get uh, differentiated will be this one, right? So on the right side of that equation, now I want to rewrite the war Takahashi identity in this way, right? So this piece went away, it's zero. I still have this del mu, which I'll now keep an x here just to remember that this derivative is acting on, on, on position x. I have delta three of gamma over del psi classical why? Let me expand this. Del psi bar classical x1. Del a, a mu classical x. Right? At this point, uh, I can take the classical fields to zero because once I, I do all these derivatives, and then I'll calculate these at zero classical field, so I can write it like that, right? Gamma is usually a function of these three guys, but instead of carrying this notation, I'll just write it like that, right? And then this part I'm throwing to the other side, right? I am doing these on the, on the right side here, so it's plus I E, right? And then these two pieces, right? The piece, the piece where I acted with two derivatives on this guy is just minus delta four x minus y one times this guy. Again, 
same thing I can calculate this in the end after taking the derivatives I'll take the classical fields to zero and then the piece I didn't calculate which is the action of these same two derivatives on on the other part but you can figure out that quite easily it's very similar the only real care is not to mess up the signs or the fermions right? and that's delta 2 delta 2 gamma 0 of del psi classical y1 del psi bar classical of x right and that's the relation I wanted right you see here that I just related a 3.1 pi function this object here to this 2.1 pi function I'm relating uh, 1 pi uh, functions uh, at uh, with different number of external legs right and in fact you you have to notice right even the generalized word Takahashi identity and these relations are completely non-perturbative right this is true at all orders in perturbation theory and it's true also for the resum of the whole series of 1 pi uh, diagrams that I can write here right this is a relation between the full functions right so I could baptize this guy as gamma uh, this has some uh, uh, spinor indexes so if I, I i give this guy a spinor index i and this guy a spinor index j this will be a function which is a matrix in spinor space so this i and j go from one to four all right it's also lauren in that has there's also a lauren index as you expected right this is a function a three-point function in QED with two fermions and a, a, a boson, right? So there's an index for one, the, the spin of one of the, the fermions, the spin of the other of the fermions, and then the spin of the, the, the photon, right? And this depends on these three positions, right? y1, x1, and x. I want to differentiate the positions for the fermions, for fermionic fields and and the, well, the photon field, right? And this, of course, is the inverse of the full fermionic propagator, right? This is, means the complete fermionic propagator, so to all orders, right? And these two point functions, as we have seen in quantum field theory one, are the inverse of these propagators. And this is the same for y1 minus x minus 1 right which is uh, pretty neat let me rewrite it in terms of these variables it looks more compact and less confusing so what I I'm getting at here is that I got this equation I exchanged the order here to get rid of this minus sign. So this comes to the right. Uh, so this guy goes here. And then this other guy goes here. And let me remove all the colors and put a, bo a box around it, right? So this is a, a pretty important relation, but in position space, right? I would like to go to momentum space. Remember, I'm interested in this object, right? Which you, usually, you are usually looking at in momentum space. Yeah. And also, this, this is good because it gives me what convention I'm using for the momenta. Right? So, all I have to do is take a, 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 a Fourier transformation on both sides of this equation, right? Using this 
here. So I just have to integrate in d4x, d4y1, d4x1, and the signs here uh, implement this direction I choose for the momenta, right? p1y1, which is going uh, in, p2 is coming out, so it goes like that, and k is also going. So I want to apply these on both sides of this equation, right? I won't do these uh, very carefully, right? Because it's a lot of algebra. Uh, the important part here is that I want to do a definition for the momentum space 1pi function, which is similar to the one we did before, right? We didn't, def we did we didn't define this guy exactly like this, because we wanted it multiplied by, by, the, by the electron charge and the uh, factor of uh, i. So what I'm defining here, right? This equation will define the momentum space 1pi function as the 2pi fourth delta fourth of momentum conservation. Right, because that's always there. Right? We know that once you do this Fourier transform on the right side, this will appear naturally, right? Once you do all the integrals. Right? And I'll define the Fourier transform of this guy instead of just being gamma of the momentum, it will be minus i e. And that's what I'm defining this object. Let's call this QED 3 meaning the 3.1 pi function in QED, it depends on these indexes, same thing as the momentum space one, so i, j, and mu, and it depends on the momentum, momenta. Right? Of course, there's momentum conservation here, so it's really redundant. I, I just need two of those, but it's fine. Let's keep it like that. Right? And this is the equation that defines this, this will be the, tr the Fourier transform of this integral applied on this guy. We should have a tree here that I disappeared with at some point. Right? This is to, to have the same definition. Remember, when we first talked about vertex functions, I said that the QED one will be given by expansion, right? Which was something like that, right? This guy would be minus i e gamma mu plus whatever comes from the loop corrections, right? I want this structure and to have this object match this one. That's why I'm pulling out this minus i e just because it's convenient. So I know that this guy will be just gamma mu at first uh, order in perturbation theory. It's just convenient, right? But most, most of the times you see war Takahashi identities uh, written is in terms of this guy, not one that it has a charge included inside, right? So now I can use this definition Applying the derivative here, so I have to apply a derivative to both sides, right? Of course, this derivative will go in here as right? the derivative in x and will act on. So, what I want is to, in that equation, what appears there is actually the Fourier transform of del mu x acting on this guy. Right? So when I take the Fourier transform on both sides of this equation, I have the derivative of this guy. Right? But again, I can do integration by parts here, throw this derivative acting on this exponential, right? and this will be equal to minus i k mu times all these things. this guy. Right? Again, assuming I have no su surface terms, right? And this is now this uh, left hand side of this equation. So this is really just minus 2 pi to the fourth 
delta 4 q1 plus k minus p2 charge k nu times gamma i j mu the mu is contracted here right q e d 3 p1 p2 k right if you do the Fourier transform on the right side carefully right you will get this expression so you have the Fourier transform of those two terms there right and that will be this expression i won't do it uh, here because it's just too much algebra and this is k plus p1 minus p2 the momentum space full propagator inverse of course minus the same thing so momentum conservation appears as expected right and this is s f c p2 minus one and then of course p2 can be exchanged because of this delta by p1 plus k so now if you equate this expression with this one you can get rid of the, the momentum conservation of the factor of 2 pi to the fourth right and you get uh, this expression which is what we were looking for all along so you have uh, i here that i'm bringing to the left side of the equation so this is just minus i k mu contracted with this put it here it's equal also the charge goes away see it's here and, and here i'm uh, here i have to close the bracket here and these two guys appear also i there's a sign so i'm bringing this guy to the right and the other guy to the left sf c p1 plus k minus one let me put this in red in, in green to bring everything into line here this is and this is the word takahashi identity proper not the generalized word takahashi identity but the real one for qed right which in diagrams Right, you could easily write, let me find my diagram here. What you're getting here is this in terms of diagrams. I'm saying that minus i k mu contracted with this guy that has an index mu is equal to. the inverse of the full propagator for momentum uh, p1 plus k minus this same thing for a different momentum in this case just p1 right which is a, a relation between this one pi function and, and you can see that you can get basically a in, infinite amount of relations between n point 1pi functions. I'll put some into the exercises for you to try to use this. And we'll see once we start doing the renormalization of QED that this essentially what, what will happen is you can imagine just looking at this, right? Suppose we don't know how many of these 
guys I'll re redefine but let's suppose just for the moment that I'll do some counter term for this guy and another counter term for this one this kind of relation will force my counter terms or my redefinition of the constants to not be independent I cannot do just any redefinition that breaks this kind of thing otherwise I'm throwing gauging variance away and that's that's where the terminology gets confusing right people say oh you're throwing gauging variance away you're, you're really breaking word takahashi identities but since there is this logical uh chain that begins with gauging variance and leads toward takahashi identities people usually abuse the language and call uh, um, call gauging variance you see in many places right I, I won't do that here but in many places you'll see people saying oh this is satisfying gauging variance and by that they mean my propagators are satisfying uh, uh, war takahashi identities so it, everything is okay this i'm satisfying the quantum version of gauging variance right so this is this is a very common way of uh, using this so that's it for now. Next uh, video, we will actually apply these, these identities to, to constrain the ways we renormalize QED. Yeah, see you then.